introduce to you uh, Thomas Ramsoy. Dr. Ramsoy is one of the leading scholars and practitioners of applied neuroscience. Uh, besides his background in neuropsychology and neurobiology, he is an innovator at heart. And uh, his work at uh, Neurons Inc. is really meant to help um, bring a lot of different tools into the application space and helping companies understand uh, different disciplines that might be able to solve the problem. So going back to some of the earlier discussions around, you know, it's not everything that gets answered by the same tool. Uh, there's uh, also the ability that he has to help people build in-house capabilities and understand the challenges that some of these solutions might present and help work through what might be best for them. So without further ado, let me introduce to you Dr. Ramsoy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Thomas. Um, I actually brought this book because I want to use this in a second. Um, I have this dual position that I, on the one hand, I'm running Neurons Inc. and I'm also a professor at the Copenhagen Business School in Copenhagen, Denmark, where we are uh, basically training people in this. So we, kind of the next generation, we train something like two, three, 300 students per year that actually are trained in neuromarketing, neuroeconomics, and behavioral economics. So there's a huge flood of people coming into this industry. Um, today I'm going to talk about, uh, you're getting tired here, this is that kind of a tough spot at the end here, so I would normally ask you, my students to raise up and shake their head or shake their body or something like that. We'll, we'll spare you for that, but we'll do something in, instead. Um, I think for me, before coming here today, I started thinking about where, where, what do I feel about this? I, and actually, I'm, I'm disappointed in a way. You know, as a neurobiologist, I'm a clinical neuropsychologist by training, I, so I did my PhD in, in uh, neurobiology. For me, it should be a no-brainer, no pun intended, to use these uh, technologies. I mean, of course, I mean, this is how we think, this is how we act. And yet, we see that companies all over are struggling with implementing this. Why is that the case? And I think some of the things that I'm working with is, is trying to, to, to build an internal language, help uh, clients build an internal language and understanding, not only of the methods and the tools, but also of how can we use the insights from neuroscience and neuropsychology and the combination of economics, psychology, and neuroscience to build a better practice, to kind of build a new way to understand and even affect people. And the other side of that is to build an internal toolbox. What kind of tools should we be using? And of course, what, some of those struggles we have is to say, okay, we already have used these tools, you know, classical tools, for a long time where we have benchmarks and normative data sets. You know, how can we combine the, the, uh, the, uh, the surveys and the focus groups with these tools? What are the pros and cons of these methods? How can they be mutually informative rather than mutually exclusive? How can we use these tools? This is some of the things I want to talk about a bit today. Um, and then, of course, coming here today and see so many people, this is also even just hearing about it in the first place, I, I, I just said, well, I need to be a gold sponsor of this. I, I definitely need to, to sponsor this in every single way I, I want to and can. And um, before going further, I think one thing that I should mention is that for those, I think some of you, maybe many of you already know, but we're running a free online course um, at Coursera. Uh, called An Introduction to Neuromarketing and Consumer Neuroscience. It starts in four days, and there are 25,000 people sign up for it. And there's actually almost 1,000 more per day, so we might even reach 30,000 if you help me. <laughs> so let's see. It's a hugely popular thing. It's a six-week course with interviews with some of the most prominent thinkers and leaders. I do some lectures. We have hands-on sessions and so forth. Um, and of course, I have my book that I can promote as well. So. So why are we thinking about this? You know, when it comes to innovation, when it comes to changing not only products, but also the way we understand consumers, there are two different ways of looking at it. One is this kind of linear path to do move, you know, let's call it. Um, this is a way to understand uh, the way in which we typically uh, are thinking and acting. We tend to have this step-by-step -step incremental change perspective. We are not doing anything wrong by improving on existing methodologies. The problem is with that is that we have severe limitations in understanding the way in which and the rate in which change is coming to us, the technological change happening to us every day, which is exponential. <clears throat> this means that we are facing a new future every single day, next week, next month, that is exponentially different from today. And we can't really understand that. This means that new technologies, new solutions that today seem impossible will be an everyday uh, tool for tomorrow. 
So I'm going to go into the hash that focus groups and services and interviews, but still, this is kind of the linear kind of thinking is that we do surveys, we do interviews, we do focus groups, we shouldn't stop doing that. And we're doing incremental improvement on those methods. The problem with that is that that solution alone puts us at risk of missing uh, kind of key, our key points in understanding emotional responses from consumers, what are driving their choices, cognitive overload, uh, what drives attention, for example. So we need to think differently. And what I want to do here today is actually to, to ask you to, to take this book, and I want you to draw this. This is going to be a really hard test for you at this time of day. A dot and a cross, and I'll make that for you. You need to have something like 10 centimeters in between. I'm going to use the metric system. So you, I'll do the demo. You do the dot, and you do the cross, OK? This is called the poor, I, I call it the poor man solution, OK? What I want you to do is to hold over your right eye, OK? Right eye. Hold that arm plane. Look with your left eye on the cross. And you slowly move it towards you. At some point in time here, the dot will disappear. Approximately at this point over here. The dot will disappear. Do it slowly. If it doesn't work, that will be your home assignment for tomorrow, I guess. <laughs> so does it work for you? And you can also flip it like this and so forth. Did you know before you come here today that you're actually blind on both eyes? No. So this is one thing I can learn you. The other thing which is really interesting is actually exactly the point you didn't know. Because your brain is making up a story. In fact, when you look at the eye, the way the eye is lo looking and taking in signals, the visual signals, there's no receptors at any of those two points in your eyes. So you're, at, you're actually blind. But your brain is making up a story. The brain is making up a coherent story that consists, kind of, is, is coherent to you. So you see the world as it is. Now, to, today, we can see that this is not just working for vision. It works at every single level of how we perceive the world. And this means that when we ask people, why did you do this? How did you choose this product? And we get some responses back. This is the thing going on. The brain is making up a coherent story. And this is why we are risking everything by just relying on one single story. We, I think we already know this in this forum. So we call this in you know, classical neurology and clinical neuropsychology, we call this confabulation, making up a story. So how can we get away, with, uh, away from confabulation? Well, one thing is, of course, to build new insights. And this is exactly the thing we are going to do here at this forum is to say, what are you know, what emotions? What is the distinction between emotions and feelings? What is a, a, attention, different kinds of attention, bottom-up, top-down attention? We need to build an internal language, both here as a discipline, but also within companies. And this is some of the things that is dear to me. We also need to, so let me see here. I think we alluded to, to the uh, Evian ad here. Actually, with a couple of ads, they're going at the same time. So one thing is we looked at the number exactly the uh, horse uh, uh, talked about here is that it was a hugely successful ad when it comes to ad liking. Everybody's talking about ad liking. Do people like this ad? It was shared something like, it was viewed something like 50 million times within the first month at YouTube. So that should be a success in itself. The problem is that at the same time, the, the sales dropped 28%. <laughs> I won't go into detail why it actually dropped, but at least it didn't increase. So it seems to be this disconnect. And uh, as we saw, uh, Neuro Insight, Richard Silverstein looked at the result and saw that people didn't connect the story with the brand. There are two learning points on that. First of all, learning to understand how the brain works allows us to make some conclusions about why things go wrong. So for example, there's something called an intentional blink, if you like. One thing is an intentional blink. Another thing is what we can call the shifting scene scenario. So while you're walking out this doorway here, for example, there is something happening in your brain that is resetting. At the instant you're walking through a door, you're resetting. The brain is kind of resetting. And whatever you are doing at that moment can be interrupted. So who hasn't tried standing all of a sudden in the living room with your toothbrush and saying, what the hell was I going to do now? Everybody can recognize the situation. It's because we are walking from one scenario to the next, and the brain is actually resetting. So if, if we have ads 
that are resetting the brains too often, we might lose crucial inf information. And this seems to be what happened with uh, this ad. So this other ad, this is a tool that I've invented. Uh, it's called Neurovision, which is an automated tool for, um, for analyzing images and videos. And what it does is actually, so it's on-the-fly cloud-based system that it upload, you upload the video, upload the, the image, and it analyzes it on the fly based on some intrinsic uh, properties of the movie. For example, what we're looking at here is the level of complexity, visual complexity in the scene. So there's a way that we can uh, put a number to the, the, the level of complexity, visual complexity in the scene. What we see here is every single time there is the crucial key information, there's a drop in the visual complexity, which is actually in itself very good, because it means that we've rid the scene for everything, and it allows people, while they're looking at the scene, to actually pay attention to what's going on and get the key message. The problem is that there's a complete disconnect between the story and the information, the key message. So this is the risk point. So this means that you can analyze these videos on the fly um, and get crucial information on how gross are those changes in the visual complexity, for example. And that's what happens, is that if you have something that is really building up to a key kind of punchline moment, and everybody laughs, for example, is that where you should put your crucial information? Maybe not. Because about a second, half a second to a full second after that, people are completely blind to whatever you show them. It's called the attentional blink. This means that crucial information that you provide with them within an ad they can be blind to because you're giving them a punchline and then you get in with a key message. That's a crucial thing to know is that maybe you should put in some information at long the time. So these are kind of key insights we can do. The other thing is using a toolbox. There was a nice study here this summer from Domoshovsky and colleagues in Nature Neuroscience and uh, Nature Communications that actually used EG in a small sample, 16 people only and looked at what we can call almost the hive mind, how similarly people respond to different ads, different um, a TV drama, for example, or um, yeah, the, the, the Walking Dead, for example. And they were able to predict with high accuracy the number of tweets for this episode and also for the ad, and also the Nielsen rating, just by 16 people. So it shows us that something going on with, even within the, within the small group that is highly predictive for what can go on in a cultural setting. This is one of just a, kind of a few things that, that we see going on today. When we're talking about um, what we're doing here today, is to push the limits of what's possible. And as Arthur C. Clarke, I'm a big fan of his, his writing, said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So this means that some of the tools we might be using today, yesterday they would be looked at as complete magic. What we can expect from the coming years might today look like magic. This is not to say that we should use, accept you know, black box solutions, but at least some of the things that we know we can, we can use already. So for example, what we can call computational neuroscience. The way in which we know things about how the vis visual system works allows us to make computational models that can predict where people are going to look automatically. So a tool like this, can, you can analyze again and see what are people most likely to, to look at. I won't go too much into detail about it. The other thing is, while we have this toolbox, why stop at doing copy testing? Why do we uh, focus so much on just product testing and copy testing? Why not test the new, new things? How do people respond to the next smartphone not only the smartphone, but the smartphone before the smartphone comes. The first time people meet a completely new tool, a completely new product. How do people respond to that? How do they respond emotionally? But also what we can call cognitive load. Is it information overload to people? So why do people adopt and don't adopt? And this is a study we did for, for Lowe's uh, Innovation Labs, for example, where we looked at how people responded to the whole room that they have just launched. What we saw was that when people were looking at products in the whole room, the emotional responses were skyrocketing compared to a real sort of environment. What we saw was that cognitive load, which is kind of the information load that people process, were much slower in the augmented reality solution. So this suggests that in the augmented reality solution, people, there's less cluttering in a way. 
that allows people to respond more purely emotionally to products. Yeah, I'll actually skip that one. This is a TV drama. We can use that. And then, while well, running up, um, one of the things we also do is to test people's responses to completely new things. Like, how are people responding to robots? There's this thing called the Uncanny Valley. I'm not sure whether you've heard about that before. But there are things, you know, if you have a completely technological kind of a, 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 a tin can robot, people don't really find that to be humanoid in that way. So people say, well, it's a robot. But as we're moving closer and closer to a product being more humane in a way, all of a sudden it becomes freaky. And that freakishness, we can assess. We can measure that as a direct emotional response to people. It's called the uncanny valley. People really dislike that. If it's too close to being human without really being human, this is well, uh, the response. It's a drop in the emotional response. It's just kind of a strong aversal, <coughs> aversal response. And of course, as companies, you'd like to see where should we get out of, how can we get out of this uncanny valley? And this is some of the things we, we do to test um, using neuroscience tools. Okay, so that was all I got. And if there might be some questions, I'd be happy to answer them here or afterwards. Thank you, Thank Thomas. You. Thank you very much.